Rahman Rahim. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Dear friends, phlebologists, vascular surgeons, and all doctors interested in venous surgery. On behalf of the board of Egyptian Venus Forum, I welcome you all to join our eighth International Congress of Egyptian Venus Forum. Uh, it is a real honor to be here for the eighth year and celebrate the World Thrombosis Day and to insist to make our conference annually on that day, emphasizing the importance of venous thrombosis and how we all work to stand against extension of venous problem along the universe. And really, it is a good chance to share our knowledge and communicate with each other along the whole universe to spread knowledge, experience among phlebologists along the whole globe. Let me welcome you all on board, and uh, I'm honored to introduce Professor Pierluigi Antoniani, the honored president of our conference this year. Professor Antoniani is a professor of angiology uh, uh, Catanzaro University, Rome, Italy, and he's a president of International Union of Angiology and General Secretary of International Union of Phlebology. Uh, it's an honor to have few welcome words from Professor Antoniani to our dear friends in Alexandria, Egypt, and along the whole universe. Please, Professor Antoniani. I'm proud of the Egyptian Venus Forum because this society is the most active society, associate society of international of angiology. And the Professor Fagli and the executive committee of the Egyptian Minos Forum work very hard to the disseminate, to the dissemination of the prebological words. So, congratulate, I con <coughs> congratulations for the eighth event <laughs> in Alexandria and if uh, in virtual modality, but this is not important, but the important is to meet all together to discuss, to discuss about the prebological problems. Thank you again and uh, good work to all. Thank you, Professor Antoniani. Thank you very much. And now we will start our memorial lecture and uh, let us fly to Toledo to the United States, and I'm honored to introduce my professor, Munir Nazal. Professor Munir is a professor of surgery and chief of division of vascular and endovascular surgery to lead the university in the United States. Uh, he is the chairman of the session, and he is going to introduce our great speaker. Please, Dr. Munir. Unfortunately, could not be there in person. Uh, I will also, in the name of the Middle East Venus Forum, would like you to participate in our upcoming meeting in December, which will be a Zoom meeting. But also, we are planning our second major international meeting in the Middle East in Dubai or Abu Dhabi next year. So please make sure that you follow us for that. 
Having said that, uh, it's a pleasure to be with our friends in Egypt, uh, Professor Fakhri and a group. I see a very prominent people in the names here that they don't need uh, to be introduced. But uh, I am very pleased and thrilled to introduce one of the most famous people to talk about APT thrombosis and other diseases related to thrombosis, uh, Dr. Joseph Caprini. Dr. Joseph Caprini is a fellow citizen here in the United States. He is a senior clinical educator in the University of Chicago Biscard School of Medicine. Um, he is very well known and he is a distinguished fellow in the Society of Vascular Surgery. Dr. Caprini's uh, contribution to DVD literature and education is known to everybody. Dr. Caprini, thank you for being with us and the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nardel. Greetings, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be able to present to you this lecture on behalf of the Egyptian Venus Forum, 13th International Congress. This is a very important day and week for us uh, all over the world. These are my disclosures. And here we see a picture of the lecture hall of Professor Virkow, Rudolf Virkow. And this is uh, the hall, the actual hall after the bombing, which was kept as a, as a museum. And the picture here depicts uh, Virkaus, uh, the actual cabinet with all of his students there listening to his lectures. Now, the reason I'm talking about this and why it's so important today is we're celebrating World Thrombosis Day, which is Virkaus' birthday. And this uh, is October 13th, and as a result of that, um, we have a, uh, a, a memorial to him based on his contributions to venous thromboembolism. This was organized by the International Society of Hemostasis and Thrombosis. And we know that 10 million deaths worldwide occurred in a recent year, and 100 to 300,000 deaths in the U.S. from fatal pulmonary emboli, and 544 thousand patients uh, died in uh, Europe as a result of this. The other astonishing fact is that more deaths than breast cancer or prostate cancer or AIDS and motor vehicle accidents combined occur as a result of venous thromboembolism compared to these other disorders. Now, what was Virchow's great contributions? He postulated that there were three elements that led to the development of venous thrombosis. Vessel wall injury, which means breaks in the endothelium, hypercoagulability, the blood clotting faster or more than normal, and venous stasis. And when one of these factors is, is present, there's a likelihood of venous thrombo thrombosis. If two are present, the likelihood is higher, and if three are present, even higher. Now here we see a typical fatal pulmonary embolism with a large saddle embolus here in the pulmonary artery. And one of the things that we have to uh, understand is that this is one of the few problems that can be prevented, fatal events that can be prevented after an operation. And we know that a thorough risk assessment, such as the Caprini score, but not exclusively, of course, um, and prescribing anticoagulants based on the patient's level of risk, this can prevent over 99% of fatalities due to venous thromboembolism after surgery. Unfortunately, although uh, PE, the PE numbers are down, uh, the mortality has increased over the past decade. There's many reasons for that. 
So let's begin by talking about the Caprini score, which is a thorough history and physical. And I would like to acknowledge the fact that although this score has my name, it came about as a result of a number of very, very bright scientists who got together with me and uh, I was at the right place at the right time, you might say, and that led to the development of the score. The additional feature why this score has been so popular and gained so much traction is because of all of you wonderful people around the world that have studied it, used it, criticized it, refined it in your own practices, in your own countries, and, and I'm, I'm grateful for all of that. Nevertheless, it's a, it's a good history and physical, and if you take a uh, uh, we know that as the number of risk factors increases, the chance of a blood clot goes up. We also know that risk factors have different powers. Bed rest is low power, and uh, carcinoma of the esophagus, for example, or uh, pancreatic cancer is high power. So combining the powers and the number of factors, we come up with a score. And this is score results in a linear and non or nonlinear in certain cases, elevation of the, uh, the score in, in proportion to clinically relevant VTE events. As the score goes up, so do the number of clinical events. We know now that it's been valid validated in over 5 million patients, and, and as of this date, 230 studies are reported in PubMed using the Caprini score. Now in 2012, when the chest consensus guidelines authorities decided that risk assessment was appropriate and Caprini score was one of the ways to assess risk. They evaluated the Caprini score and they decided that a score of five or above would lead to a 6% incidence of venous thromboembolism if the patients weren't receiving prophylaxis. Now that was 2012. That's not true today. So let's just take a look at this. That we have, you have to, uh, it's very important to understand that the set point for highest risk depends upon the population. It's not just five. Here are the results for five. In general surgery, it's a little over 1%. Head and neck surgery, a little less than 1%. Plastic surgery, a little over 1%. Actually, in the ICU population, it is around 6%. But take a look at this. When you go to the next level, when you go to a score of eight and above eight, nine and above, you will see in general surgery, the, the rates jump to 6.5%. They jump to 8.5% in surgical ICU. They, they jump to 11%, over 11% in plastic surgery, and astonishingly to over 18% in head and neck surgery. Now, the good news about the Caprini score is it's a thorough history and physical. The bad news is it's hard to collect all those elements, especially at the time of emergency admission, including during this COVID pandemic. But thanks to some brilliant people around the world, a patient-friendly version has been validated in many languages. We know that patients like to get involved in their health care, so if you give them a, a form to help fill out their criteria, their risk assessment, uh, that is a great help in collecting these data. Here is the risk assessment score, and there's two very important elements to this. And these two elements are seen in no other risk score. Obstetrical, complications. Birth control, uh, hormone replacement therapy and birth control pills, of course, are, are uh, uh, risk factors and that, that's very common, but obstetrical complications, preeclampsia, other toxemias, stillborn infants, three or more spontaneous abortions, uh, patients born with a small, a low birth weight or placental and placental insufficiency, all of these are things that could lead to very serious complications. We're going to discuss that in a minute. The other one that's very important and unique to this score, and one other, is a family history of thrombosis. Only the Department of Health VTE risk assessment tool from the National Health Service in the UK talks specifically about listing family thrombosis as a risk factor. And in the United Kingdom, mandating the use of this tool over a two-year period actually cut deaths, just to show you how important family history of thrombosis is. Now let's go back to the obstetrical problems. And again, recurrent unplanned abortion, stillbirths, premature births with toxemia, growth-restricted infant. Any of these patients, any of these uh, clinical events can signal in the patient, in the mother, that she is carrying one or more of 
the thrombophilic defects known as lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipid antibody, or beta-2 glycoproteins. And if all three are positive, the chance of a, uh, of a venous thromboembolism is high. And these are strong predictors of thrombotic events. And believe me, in many patients, they carry these defects through their life, not just during their obstetrical career, if, as, if you will. Uh, some of these go away, but others don't. So it's very important to ask about this obstetrical history. As far as family history goes, we know that things run in families, number one. We also know that thrombophilic defects, and that is any coagulation abnormality that can be shown to be associated with the blood clot, they're uncommon. Over 80% of patients who develop a blood clot, a DVT, you can't find anything wrong with their blood. But family history is different. If a patient doesn't have a clot but has a positive family history in a first, second, or third degree relative, then the incidence of uh, thrombosis in that patient without a history except a family history is increased. In some cases, really increased if they have other risk factors. And there's even a slight association with people that live together, and this may be due to common lifestyles of, the, of the, those individuals. That's unknown. That's unknown. The other thing is you can't just do the score when the patient comes into the hospital. And this holds true for any score. During, during the uh, hospitalization, reoperation may become necessary, or in the case of medical patients, surgery may become necessary. Infection may develop. Central lines may be used for IV access. Cancer may be diagnosed. And therefore, the, the, the score has to be updated. And often, it, it, has, it will result in a change in the prophylactic approach, whereas a patient may come in with a low score that doesn't merit prophylaxis, but would just increase their bleeding. But then during hospitalization, develop some seri very serious risk factors that would cause them to uh, have a serious or fatal event. And under those circumstances, prophylaxis needs to be done. So it's a dynamic instrument. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about anesthesia. We talk about surgical procedures as being low risk or high risk, but that's only a part of the story. The other part of the story is low risk surgical patients can be very high risk because they're carrying multiple risk factors. But one of the things that's important, and this is why the time of anesthesia is important, is because when an anesthetic is given, venous stasis occurs due to calf muscle paralysis. The veins then get over distended. So you get, when they get that distended, you will see you can develop cracks in them. So that's uh, endothelial uh, uh, injury. Then hypercoagulability occurs uh, due to several mechanisms. First of all, the stasis in the blood, the slowing down of the blood can trigger clotting. Also, the muscles are metabolizing and producing waste products, which are now sitting in this puddle that's, that's not moving out of the leg. That can trigger clotting. And then, of course, whatever the underlying pathology was, maybe the patient's being operated on for infection or cancer, they're hypercoagulable to begin with. Putting all that, that together and then, and then intensifying those effects over time, this is a Virchow's triad experiment, if you will, that occurs every time a patient gets a general or regional anesthetic. And that's why it's very important to use pneumatic compression devices during these, this period of immobilization to, to modify these effects. It can't reverse them altogether. This is a one, thousand, one million power micrograph of a dilated capillary during an experiment. And you can see the cracks in the endothelium that develop when, a, when, they, when the venous system, capillaries, veins, whatever, get over distended, they crack. And as they, they, the reason they get over distended is they get overfilled with blood. And then when those cracks occur, that produces a, a, a opening of the blood and, and it's able to, to uh, come in contact with collagen and that's what starts the clot. Here it is, here's the, a closer view of the one million power micrograph and you can see how clots can form in these areas of exposed collagen. Now, not only that, but when venous stasis occurs, what happens is that the white cells change into adhesion molecules. See that darkening? Because there's stasis. And those adhesion molecules actually will slow down and gradually become attached to the wall of the capillary. 
And once they do that, and full adhesion occurs, they will extrude granules and produce an inflammatory reaction that then damages the wall of the capillary on a permanent basis. And then other white cells come along, change into adhesion molecules, and repeat that process. That capillary is no longer able to function. And here you see an experiment, a, a, a photomicrograph of the actual experiment, and here an adhesion molecule is about to pierce the capillary wall, and this is the collagen underneath it. And this is a very powerful mechanism as a result of venous stasis and activation of the white cells. In addition to that, this is a picture of a patient with a slightly bent knee, and then you straighten the knee using the duplex scan observation. And you can see as the, as the flexed leg is extended, the head of the gastrocnemus in some patients can block the popliteal vein. And as a result of that, the blood flow is slowed out of the leg even further because it has to go around channels in the surface system to get out of the leg. All of these effects together produce a very serious problem. And uh, two things about this. First of all, this phenomenon is well known by military and, and guards, so they always encourage the guards when they're standing at attention not to have their knees straight, but to bend them very slightly. And the second thing is that we know that most of the time when you're having an operation, they put a pillow underneath your knee to prevent this phenomenon from happening. Now, it's all well and good to have a good assessment of risk and to know that as the risk factors increase, the chance of a blood clot will go up. But unless there is a connection between the evidence base and its execution, we have a problem, just like this poor man on the motorcycle. And reducing deaths requires not only a good program of outlining a risk assessment schema, but it has to be mandated with mandatory implementation except for uh, problems. Doctors always have to have the ability to opt out, but in general, this is a requirement. Now, I'd like to show you the results from the Boston University that were done a number of years ago. They had a high incidence of venous thromboembolism on their service. You can see the green line was the national average. And they instituted several programs, including a mandatory risk assessment uh, to uh, try to get around this. And you might say, and, and if you take a look at this, their incidence of venous thromboembolism was down to a tenth of a percent, 30 days, including mortality, after this program was in place. And the question is, how did they do that? Well, they had a mandatory algorithm. And if the patients had a score of less than five, then you could do whatever you wanted in the hospital, vis-a-vis -vis stockings, pneumatic compression devices, just early ambulation or anticoagulation, whatever you felt was appropriate. But if they had a score of five to eight, they got seven to 10 days of low molecular weight injections. It didn't, it, didn't, it didn't vary where they were. As a matter of fact, a lot of those patients by that time, of course, were home, but the, uh, the compliance for that was 89%. Now, in those patients that had a score of nine and above, they got 30 days of low molecular weight heparin, and 77% of those pa patients complied. Now, you might say, how did they get this done, given the cost of, it, of low molecular weight heparin and so on and so forth? Well, the, well, the hospital is, uh, takes care of the indigent population that's part of their responsibility. And they made a deal with the drug companies that any patient that needed this drug would get it, regardless of their ability to pay. Isn't that a wonderful poster child? What if every hospital in the United States followed this Boston policy? We would dramatically lower the incidence of venous thromboembolism. Assessment, scoring, mandatory implementation. Now let's take a look at some results from around the world. And if you take a look at, this is a, a, a score of used, comparing the Padua score to the Caprini score, and this is in patients in China. And you can see that using the Caprini score in these patients, as the risk went up five to six, seven to eight, and over nine, there was a, uh, a very dramatic increase in the incidence of venous thromboembolism. Now, matter of fact, here, here we see again the over nine. Look at the tremendous difference between seven to eight and just adding one more factor. That's really the nuts and bolts and the importance of the Caprini score is the gradation of risk. And that will determine, in this case, length of prophylaxis. 
And then, of course, if we look, and this is an unfair comparison because the Padua score only looks at a few risk factors, Caprini score looks at 40, so naturally we're going to pick up more cases. Now, I would hasten to add that you need to do risk assessment. It is not possible in every hospital, in every location, in every culture, in every healthcare system to do the Caprini score. You have to use whatever score works in your area. And if that's a Padua score, that's fine. If it's the approved score, that's great. Um, so that there are many roads to Rome. The important thing is make sure you score your patients. Here we see the, uh, a very, very important study because this shows what happens when people get together. Four Hanoi hospitals over a two-year period scored 2,795,000 patients with the Caprini score, and you can see here again the same results. Look at the scores of five to six, a little over 1%. Uh, and if you get up to uh, over eight, it's four and a half percent. The same values. Now these numbers are slightly different. It's a different country. It's a different healthcare system. But look at the graph. This graph mirrors every other graph where the Caprini score is properly done. Now we go to Moscow. Kirill Lobostov and his associates have done some very important work regarding the Caprini score. And here is one of their first, first studies in very seriously ill patients. And in all of these patients, they, uh, they use duplex scans uh, to evaluate them. And if the score was 5 to 8, only 1.9% of people got a clot. If it was 9 to 11, just adding one more, it went up to 26%. And it skyrocketed to 65% if the score was 12 to 15. And uh, it's very, very important to see. Again, it's the same story, different country. Now, when they looked at that 65%, these were people getting low molecular weight heparin. So they went back and looked at some more studies, and they saw that the frequency of symptomatic VTE, now that the previous study was with uh, duplex scans, but they had a symptomatic rate of 11% in those with a score of 11 or greater, the 11-11 rule. And the asymptomatic events, as I say, were very high, 59 to 65%. Despite the combination of pneumatic compression, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, of, of graduated compression stockings and low molecular weight effort prophylaxis, no pneumatic compression. So they said, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to escalate the low molecular weight heparin dose? Or perhaps are we going to combine the current treatment with pneumatic compression? And that's what they did. 407 patients were randomized to either get the standard low molecular weight effort stocking approach or adding to that pneumatic compression. All patients underwent duplex, blinded duplex leg scans 12 hours postoperatively and every three to five days. Low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis was given at least seven days or more in all patients and pneumatic compression was used for 18 hours daily. The results. Duplex scanning revealed 34 breakthroughs in the patients not receiving pneumatic compression in the low molecular weight effort stocking alone group. Whereas if they had the combination of stockings, low molecular weight heparin, uh, and intermittent pneumatic compression, there was only one breakthrough. So this shows you why pneumatic compression is not dead. And uh, to carry it a step further, those patients in the control group without the pneumatic compression, five of them got a, a pulmonary embolus, three of them died. And no PE was seen in the study group. Now, there are people and there are publications talking about eliminating pneumatic compression because it's unnecessary and doesn't improve the results. You look at those studies carefully, you will see they didn't do risk assessment. And here it is. This is the poster child for using IPC outside of the operating room. Everybody needs pneumatic compression in the operating room. I hope you all understand that from what we presented, especially on Greer Cow's birthday. But in addition to that, people that have high risk scores benefit from pneumatic compression, and if they can use a portable device at home, all the better. And there were no differences with skin injury or bleeding in those patients. Now let's talk about COVID-19. COVID-19 has been a worldwide pandemic that affected all of us and is of great concern right up to the present time. And this is a viral-induced inflammation that triggers cytokine storm causing tissue factor release, thrombogeneration, fibrin formation, 
to coat the virus and prevent spread. That's a really, really beautiful mechanism. Unfortunately, the side effect is thrombosis and lots of them. Activation of D-dimer occurs. For the first time, we're seeing large numbers of, of in situ pulmonary thrombosis. Not only embolus, but thrombosis. We're also seeing thrombosis in any organ of the body where there's a blood vessel because it attacks the blood vessels. And it can result in organ insufficiency. When the clotting gets triggered, fibrinolysis is triggered, and that can lead to bleeding. And in some cases, you get a consumptive like coagulopathy, uh, which is a very difficult thing to control. Here we're looking at the beautiful alveolar endothelial interface in the lung. The COVID-19 virus has a predilection for attacking this particular area and, of course, interfering with the exchange of oxygen and nutrients from the blood. This process of the COVID-19 virus, which is like an arrow piercing this area, is this, this uh, uh, process is facilitated by an ACE2 receptor. And as a result of that, it triggers this tremendous response of the body including inflammatory response, uh, antigen antibody-like response with the kinin system, and of course, uh, uh, thrombosis. In addition to that, pulmonary edema tends to occur, and unfortunately, when these areas are damaged, they may never be able to heal, and you may have permanent lung damage as a result of that. Well, what is going on here with COVID-19? Oscar Ratnoff, a famous hematologist, has the, had the answer. He studied John Hageman and found that John Hageman had a defect in factor 12, one of the, the, era, the, the beginning of the clotting cascade. Now, Oscar Ratnoff, of course, and Davies together described the clotting cascade. As a matter of fact, Oscar Ratnoff was a little upset that he didn't get the Nobel Prize for it. In any event, this is, this is Nobel Prize stuff although he, he wasn't awarded it. What he said was, he went back to four experiments done in the 1800s and put together a, a, a postulate, which he then later proved in his laboratories, he and others, that once the contact activation factor Hageman gets triggered, it triggers platelets, coagulation, fibrinolysis, complement, the inflammatory response, and calocrine antigen antibody like response without an antigen antibody reaction and the results of that are thrombosis fibrinolysis increased vascular permeability vasodilatation bradycardia angioedema histamine release and hypotension wow what a complex series of events and if you will COVID-19 is the tangled hemostatic web of Ratnov on steroids, as it were, really magnified a hundred times. Now, I'd like to read the words of Oscar Ratnov because they're really important today and we have to have investigators get together and uh, understand this better and work together better. The thesis of my talk is not too true and not new. We think about clotting, fibrinolysis, immune reactions, and inflammation as if they were separate and separable processes. In truth, these distinctions are man-made. In real life, it's the body as a whole that responds to the injury. The processes through which it defends itself are interlocked like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. We may be intrigued by the intricate pieces of this puzzle, but the picture emerges only that when they are put together. So let's all of us get together from the various disciplines to improve the care of these patients. And of course, this explains clearly, clearly, why anticoagulation as alone is not the answer. Speaking of anticoagulation, let's talk about some very, very important trials that have been done around the world. Initially, when this disease started and all this clotting was seen, everybody used different doses of anticoagulation, feeling that if they used a high enough dose, they could block the clotting and stop this COVID-19. Well, that didn't pan out. The bleeding rate went up. You even have pulmonary hemorrhages, which were seen in addition to pulmonary thrombosis. So that didn't work. 
So this NIH multi-platform was put together to study the problem. Some of the most brilliant investigators from around the world put together a beautiful study, and it was published in two parts in the New England Journal. The reason for two parts is what they showed was comparing prophylactic anticoagulation to therapeutic anticoagulation in the seriously ill ICU patients did not lower the death rate or DVT rate, but increased bleeding. Whereas, the second paper, patients that had uh, a COVID-19 illness and they weren't in ICU, they benefited more. And the trial showed that full dose anticoagulation was superior to prophylactic dose anticoagulation. And it also reduced the need for organ support, the ECMO, uh, procedure and also mortality in moderately ill hospitalized patients. DBT rates were less. No really individual risk assessment was done in detail. Now, following that very closely after was the anticoagulation uh, for coronavirus uh, in South America. And again, brilliant investigators beautiful trialists. They put together a very, very solid uh, trial. Um, and this was published in, in the Cardiology Journal and presented in the American College of Cardiology. And they said just the opposite. They said patients who were, who were at moderate or high risk, they did not benefit from therapeutic anticoagulation. Everybody should get prophylactic anticoagulation. And even giving the, the, the uh, continued prophylaxis with rivaroxaban or low molecular weight heparin uh, through 30 days afterwards didn't improve the results. Again, no individual risk assessment. Now, I am, uh, compared to these brilliant investigators, I, I, I feel like a little grain of sand. They're so bright and accomplished. Uh, but I have a very simple, uh, perhaps, explanation. And that is that the, is the lack of individual thorough risk and patient risk assessment not looking at one or two things, but a thorough individual patient risk assessment. One explanation for disagreement regarding the benefits of anticoagulation dosing in COVID-19. Well, I've never, I've never been uh, uh, enamored with uh, putting everyone in the same shoe. I don't think it's a good idea. And now I would like to change for just a minute and talk about a very exciting project involving risk glory. And two high school students from Georgia in the United States gave the patient-friendly version to their classmates' friends uh, and uh, to fill out. And these students are part of the wonderful Global Thrombosis Forum that was started by Atul Adu and his wife, which is a nonprofit organization designed to improve the knowledge of science in young people. And Astonishingly, 1,219 responses came back within a month. And among those, family history of blood clots. Look at this. 22% of them responded that they had a family history of blood clots. And there were other major findings. Uh, most of these the, the respondents were less than 41 or 41 years of age or less. And uh, a quarter of them had an elevated BMI. 10% had infections, swollen legs, or insulin-dependent diabetes. Now, I felt that when I saw these results that this was a powerful tool for obtaining complete risk assessment data, and the student-family collaboration was a secret weapon, if you will, in capturing essential family events, especially the history of thrombosis. Verifying the results, if those people took those results to their personal physician, got them verified, and put in their chart, then they would have a baseline score that was always available, avoiding time-consuming interview when admission or surgery was necessary. Well, some of these brilliant people, one of them being my partner, came back to me and said, you know, Joe, this program is biased. Because if you give homework to your, send homework home, the parents and grandparents are going to try to get, help the kids with their homework. And I said, that's just the point. This is a unique way for families to huddle together and get that family history straight. And look at this graph of the number of patients. Uh, this is score versus a, uh, the number of patients who have had a family history of blood clots. 
And this is really compelling. And this is the reason, this is the punchline for this whole discussion now. And we're gonna get back to COVID-19 in a minute and risk assessment. Take a look at the patients over at the age of 75. There were, there were 28, 20, there were 19.3% of them. So 20% of the patients were, were older than 75. Their average baseline score was eight or nine. Now remember that number. Now that same brilliant partner of mine, Alfonso Tafour, and his uh, brilliant cohort, who's internationally known, Alex Parabolis, as a matter of fact, on this day, uh, on the World Thrombosis Day, he'll be giving a major lecture on behalf of the International Society of Hemostasis and Thrombosis. And Alex has done tremendous work to advance the cause of the improved score, which has been shown to be very effective in medical patients. So they took the Caprini score and the improved score, and they did it on 184 patients who were admitted with COVID. Uh, and they found that either score could predict the DBT rate or the mortality rate. And this, this is a, this was the first actual documentation that you really needed to score these patients in detail using established scoring systems. The Caprini score in this case and the Padua score. I mean, I'm sorry, the improved, excuse me, the improved D-dimer score in this case. You can see the, the points given and uh, the low-risk patients with a score of zero to one had a 15% incidence of mortality. Look at that compared to moderate and high where the results were over 60%. So wouldn't that tell you right away which patients would benefit uh, from the a fuller course of anticoagulation? And, and certainly you would want to avoid any increase in anticoagulation above uh, prophylactic levels in patients with a low score, because that would just increase their bleeding. So now let's take a look at the Caprini score results because if we have all these grades of low, moderate, high, highest, and so forth. Incidence of DVT, very low, and the score was low four or five percent, but it was almost 30 percent when the score of nine or above. Now think of all those baseline patients. Uh, they weren't patients, they were family members. They weren't sick, they just had family, they had a family scoring done and they had a score of, of eight. Well, if they got COVID, it would be over eight and they would have up to a 30 percent chance of having a blood clot. But wait, this is even more compelling. Low risk patients would not die if you compared them by score, and if you took a look at the moderate risk patients, Caprini score, even the highest risk patient, or the moderate risk for sure, there was a low incidence of venous thrombosis. There was an 80% for mortality in patients with a score of above nine. So those patients, those people that were interviewed and had a score of eight, but they weren't sick, and then they got COVID, and they, uh, then they had a chance of to die that could have been as high as 80%. Very dramatic. Uh, you know what, this is nothing new. We knew prior to COVID that we couldn't put everybody in the same shoe and everybody now is doing risk assessment around the world. Padua score, Geneva score, Caprini score, NIH, uh, or I mean the NIA National Health Service score, uh, improved score. Everybody started doing scoring before COVID-19. And here is Alex Peropolis now, done the best, the best in medical patients a 56% symptomatic VTE decrease with no increase in bleeding, scoring patients uh, uh, using the improved score. We knew that coming in. And now, thank goodness to Eduardo Ramacati, and I, I, I like to highlight him because he has been undaunted. I don't think he goes to sleep. And when you talk to him, he says, I don't sleep much. He was involved at one point in 68 trials of robbing COVID. And he was very emotionally involved because he had horrendous thrombi occurring in those patients down at where he lives in Brazil. And he had uh, patients losing their arms and legs and so forth. Anyway, brilliant series of investigators, also including um, my partner. Uh, and what they showed was this was giving, uh, this was medically ill patients using the improved score. And they showed a 67% relative risk reduction in the composite of symptomatic VTE, VTE related death, asymptomatic VTE, and symptomatic all thromb uh, arterial thrombotic events, MI, 
non-hemorrhagic strokes, male patients, and cardiovascular deaths. This was using rivaroxaban for 30 days post-discharge, when the depending on the score. And this trial clearly illustrates the most important lesson learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. And I shouldn't say learn, relearn, because we knew that before. Alex proved it before, others proved it. This, we're, we're again reminded for all you young people in the audience about the importance of history. This is a real game changer for COVID-19 going forward. Now, in conclusion, I would like to uh, actually pay tribute to my dear friend from Maine who died this last week after a serious bout with cancer. And I was with him one time, we were walking along the road, and he was asking me what I did, and I was talking about risk assessment. And he said, well, Joe, it's very simple. This man was an academic uh, man of very high caliber, but in addition to that, he had something which you can't buy, common sense. And what he said was, Joe, when you meet somebody, they're your stranger. So you've got to interrogate them with this because then you'll know enough about them so now you're, they're like a friend. And of course, you would never hurt a friend uh, and uh, you would never uh, kill them, especially uh, because you didn't give them prophylaxis. But on the other hand, you would never, ever treat a stranger. So I'd like to thank you very much for the honor of presenting this lecture. Uh, I would like to direct you to my social media platforms uh, and I would like you to stay tuned. I want you to have a, a fantastic Congress. Uh, all the best. Stay, stay safe and have a great day. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Cabrini. It is a very important and very interesting lecture as usual. And uh, I welcome uh, you to our conference. Uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Nazal uh, to comment on your talk or uh, give uh, little questions? So, Dr. Caprini, thank you very much, sir, for this very nice lecture. And uh, we all benefit from your work on uh, DBT. To the point I uh, asked my PA student and resident sitting behind me to watch this lecture. So the question I have, really, and I hope it's for everybody else, um, in the presence of easy access to ultrasound, D-dimer, uh, most people don't even try to scope. They just prophylaxis everybody, and if they suspect to D-dimer, an ultrasound. Where should we start the scoring? Uh, what should we score people? I know we have multiple scores. That's a very important question, and I'd like everybody to uh read the meta-analysis by Christopher Panucci from 2017, where he clearly shows that people with a, with a low score, not only does it not change the VTE rate, but it increases bleeding and other complications related to the injections. And giving everybody, one of the big mistakes is giving everybody the same treatment putting everybody in the same barrel. And that will never work. We, we know that doesn't work. And, and uh, people need to be individualized and risk assessed because uh, maybe as many as half of those patients or more do not need anticoagulation. And those that need it, need it for the period of time shown to be in clinical trials efficacious, which is usually seven to 10 days and maybe 30 days if they're very, very high risk. So targeting those patients with appropriate anticoagulation is the key. And the other thing is that uh, uh, or a D-dimer uh, is not a pelvic. I think we had a little technical uh, problem. Recording. If, if, if you give them anticoagulation 
for that period of time, you can assure them that almost nobody will die. Now, will people still get blood clots? Of course they will. You can't prevent all blood clots. But you can prevent deaths. It's one of the few things that we can prevent after hospitalization uh, or uh, surgery. And to give everybody the same dose then is a terrible mistake because then that puts a uh, because of the bleeding complications. I just looked at a study in obstetrical patients, 24,000 patients, and they were all given per protocol low molecular weight heparin after delivery. And they didn't, it didn't change their DVT rate but increased the bleeding. Hello? Why haven't you learned the lesson? You can't do that. That will not work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions from the attendants? I have a question. I have myself a question for, for uh, Dr. Capri. Uh, now, you're talking about uh, Caprini score or risk assessment for patients. What about uh, estimating the risk score for normal people? Uh, to predict uh, the liability for uh, initiating or develop DVT. Does it work in such a manner? So I understand the question. You're asking if people before they get sick should do a score. Yes. Well, that, 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 as you saw in that, stu that student project, the students gave this are just come to the families. And within one month, they got 1,200 responses back. And if the patients were over the age of 75, their average score without being sick was eight, which is high. So if they got COVID, if they had an operation, their score would go into the highest risk group and they would need prophylaxis. So the importance of scoring people before they get sick is if that can be in their record, then when they get sick, you will already have a good baseline and figure out which patients need prophylaxis. So it's very important. I encourage everybody to go to my new updated website, either venusdisease.com or for, it will forward you to capriniriscore.org. And you can take your own risk assessment and you can print it out for yourself. We don't keep any data, by the way. It's all, we keep nothing. But you can do that, and, and if, 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 then take that to your doctor and show it to them. And then, you know, if you don't have electronic medical records, you have paper. You can keep that paper, and you can bring it with you to the hospital, and, uh, and, and I think that's very important. So the only way that we're ever going to improve the VTE deaths is to have uh, people do good scoring ahead of time, and then also once you have an algorithm for which scores need prophylaxis, it has to be mandatory, except for exceptional cases where there may be an increased risk of bleeding. So there is a question from the attendants. If somebody based on scoring was started on anticoagulation and they developed uh, bleeding, what is the next best prophylaxis? Well, that's, that's a, uh, that's a very good question because that's always a, 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 an issue. But the, the first thing is that, I mean, it all depends. Uh, normally, you could, you could, go, you could go to uh, pneumatic compression uh, and, uh, and wait till the bleeding subsides and then restart the anticoagulation. In a few cases, you might have to put in a vena cava filter, but that's a very, very tricky decision because the vena cava filter is also associated with a lot of complications. So that's, that's a real problem. But the one thing to remember about somebody that starts to develop a bleeding complication is that once they're treated for that and they improve, then you can restart the anticoagulation. I have to have an actual case to, to be more specific. Yes, thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes, I have, uh, I have a question here in Alexandria, Dr. Tamil Fekri, please. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Caprini, for your uh, very nice talk. 
Um, going back to this high school project uh, uh, with the families or members with the scoring eight, do we need to give them prophylactic anticoagulation regardless if they are not going to operations or uh, they are not infected with COVID? Oh, no, not at all. Uh, the importance of that and the importance of that project is that when you come into the hospital, especially if it's an emergency, if you come in short of breath from COVID and, and you're desperately ill, nobody's going to ask you about your family history, especially, and, your obs and if it's a lady, her obstetrical history. Now, what's important about that is that if there is a family history of thrombosis, which is unknown, then that may spell the difference between somebody dying or not because they're not given the proper prophylaxis. Uh, and obstetrical misadventures uh, uh, complications as well because those people may carry the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome uh, for life sometimes. And that's a powerful indicator for venous thrombosis. So no, the, the, the idea is to get everybody to get a baseline now, I know when you go to the doctor, they want to know, in the United States, first of all, if you go to the dentist, you have to fill in your whole health history before they'll even talk to you. And if you go for an appointment now, in my med I went for an appointment last week to the hospital. That I had, I had a, a, a medical appointment. I had to tell them ahead of time all of my insurance information, COVID information, all, all sorts of most important information regarding a, 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 your, your own risk assessment wasn't asked. And all they have to do is put up a chart and you could check off on the chart or you're off with a voice recognition chatbot. If you call the bank, if you call a company, you get a computerized voice. Well, you could have a computerized voice that you could talk to and answer questions and that would help you do the risk assessment. So there's all sorts of, of ways to do that. But I think if every high school did that project, that uh, the, uh, the amount of information would be gained and people would have a low, you would lower the incidence of fatal pulmonary amp because let's face it, all over the world, no matter who you are, if, you're, if your sons or if your children or grandchildren come to you with homework, you're gonna help them, you're gonna try to get it done right. And that causes families to huddle together and talk about their history. Sometimes that's the only way that that's done. And just to carry this a step further, if you have an op, if you go into the hospital and, uh, and you go to see a doctor, let's say uh, a lady has a breast lesion and the biopsy comes back cancer and uh, it's on a, a, a percutaneous biopsy done by the radiologist, then then she goes to see the surgeon. It's, it, they're not going to recite her history. She's going to know what's going to happen to me. Am I going to die of this cancer? Do I have to have my breast removed? What about my, uh, my uh, lymph nodes under my arm? Will I get swelling? Will I ever be the same? Can I have reconstruction? How expensive will this be? How long will I be out of work? Will I ever be the same? Millions of questions and worries and concerns. It's normal. It's human behavior. But if she had a stick of paper there and said, oh, but uh, here's my risk assessment baseline, and oh, not only did your mother have a PE, but your grandmother died of a PE. Oh, 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 oh wow. Oh, look at your breast surgery. You know, breast surgery is low risk surgery. It's superficial. It's a superficial organ. We don't usually use prophylaxis. But if you have that family history, then maybe we, then you should get prophylaxis. And failure to do that, then that patient could die. And forget about thrombophilia markers. They're expensive. Not everybody does them. And they don't tell the whole story. 70 or 80 percent of patients, at least, that have a history of venous thrombosis, they have negative thrombophilia markers. So it's and and you look at you figure out all the risk assessment scores in the world that have family history of thrombosis, and I believe you'll only find two. The other one is the National Health System uh, uh, document from the British, and they have actually lowered their DBT rate, as I mentioned, uh, over a two-year period by mandating using the risk assessment. Now, isn't it perfect? It's not perfect. My risk assessment's not perfect, but it has family history of thrombosis in it. And I believe that was one of the reasons why it's a very effective, a very effective tool. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Caprini. I know we are coming close to the end of the hour. Finally, quick question. Blood group AO and uh, COVID and risk system. Well, we need to have more data about the blood groups, but there definitely is some indication that certain, certain blood groups may be more likely than others. But that's the, 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 usually in, is not the determining factor. I just want to talk about COVID for a minute because, you know, if you have COVID and you're in the hospital, chances are, or even if you're at home, but chances are your D-dimer will be elevated. And if your D-dimer is elevated, that counts three points on the Caprini score. So right away that might put you in the high-risk category. And for those patients, uh, we would recommend uh, uh, escalating their anticoagulation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cabrini. Thank you, and I would like to say what a great honor it is for me to be able to interact with you, and I'm very, very appreciative for all the work you have done in the Middle East to advance the cause of venous thromboembolism and all the work you've done with, with supporting my score. The reason that that score is successful is all you wonderful people around the world. It has little to, or nothing to do with me. So thank you very much, and I wish you great success with the rest of your con Congress, and you have a wonderful day. Thank you, Professor Cabrini. And uh, please, Professor Nazel, uh, uh, would you close the session to start our first session? So thank you very much, Dr. Cabrini. Really, it was a pleasure, as usual, listening to you to talk about DVD and the scores. Uh, and uh, I really think we need a lot more data and more in, uh, research on COVID because it's a different ball game. But thank you very much for your efforts uh, in every aspect related to DVD. Thank you and have a good day, sir. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Green, and thank you, Professor Nazel. And uh, now I will uh, ask. Uh, uh, Dr. Mamdouh Al-Mizayin, the chairman for the first session, to join the panel. We have uh, uh, Dr. Antoniani, uh, chairman of the session, and uh, Professor Lowell Kabnik. I think he's uh, going to join us uh, shortly. Uh, I would like to introduce Professor Mamdouh Al-Mizayin. Professor Mamdouh Al-Mizayin, he is a professor of vascular surgery and uh, past pres uh, present uh, and chairperson of vascular surgery unit in uh, Suez Canal University and uh, has a lot of uh, experience in venous uh, surgery. Uh, I will, uh, I'm honored to be one of his uh, students and uh, I'll ask him to start the session. <laughs> 